Back in lecture three, I defined a logic circuit as an entity having a set of inputs, a set of outputs, a behavioral specification, and a timing specification. But I didn't describe the timing specification. Today, we're going to revisit that. Although we haven't addressed it directly, combinational logic has inherent delay. We haven't addressed this directly because previously we were focused on logic behavior as opposed to the physical characteristics of a deployed logic circuit, which includes things such as combinational delay, power consumption, and area. Behavioral simulations like model sim and verilator model gate delay as an epsilon delay, or, or in other words, an infinitely small non-zero amount of time, where an actual logic gate has a measurable delay, which itself depends on the underlying physical technology on which the gate is built. For an individual logic gate, there's a delay between when the input changes to when the output changes. Assuming the input changed in a way that necessitates a corresponding change in the output. In other words, you can observe this delay by changing an input that causes a change to the row on the truth table having a different output than the original row that you were on based on the original inputs. This gate delay is caused by internal resistance and capacitance within the transistors that comprise the logic gate. The delay is usually measured from the time when the input is changing and halfway between the zero and one voltage level. And, and, and then you then measure the, the point in time when the output, the corresponding output change, is halfway between the zero and one voltage level, and then the difference in those two times is the delay. Some changes to the gate's input don't cause change to its output, depending on uh, the logical function uh, being performed by the gate. But if we know the maximum amount of time that it would take if a change in the output does occur from a change in the input, then we know how long we would need to wait for any change that might potentially occur. So we need to know the longest it could take for the output to update as a result of an, a change to the inputs. And this is called the propagation delay, or T sub PD, or I, I mean, I'll just call it TPD, which is the maximum delay between when an input changes to the final change in the corresponding output. In other words, when the output stabilizes as a result of the input changing. However, this, the propagation delay is the maximum amount of time it'll take for the output to update. Sometimes a gate's output will require a shorter amount of time to change and stabilize in response to an input change. So the soonest a gate's output will change in response to an input change is called the contamination delay, or T sub CD, or just TCD. The difference in time between the propagation and the contamination, or you know, the latest a gate may output may change versus the soonest a gate's output may change is caused by uh, various factors. You know, differences in the rising and falling delay, the time it takes for an input to rise or fall, which is generally caused by differences uh, in the p-type and n-type transistors in CMOS design. But it could also it's also uh, caused by variations in where different inputs and outputs connect within the internal structure of a gate, or uh, sometimes the, the speed of the gate changes according to the temperature, the, you know, the environmental temperature. Uh, a combinational circuit that is comprised of multiple gates, 
will have multiple paths through which the inputs flow to the outputs. A fan out is when a gate's output is connected to the inputs of more than one other gate. Uh, so there are two raised to the nth power paths per input where n is the number of gate fanouts along the input path. So in this case, we have one fanout here that affects input A, B, and C, meaning that the total number of paths is 2 to the first power plus 2 to the first power plus 2 to the first power plus 2 to the zeroth power because input D does not fan out. So the total number of paths through this circuit uh, across all the inputs is 7. In this example, though, there are only four paths since there are no fan outs. So four inputs, four paths. Each path has its own propagation delay that you obtain from adding up the propagation delays of all the gates along that path. And each path also has its own contamination delay that is obtained from adding the contamination delays of all the gates along the path. The path in the circuit having the maximum propagation delay is called the critical path. And the path with the minimum contamination delay is called the short path or the shortest path. As I mentioned before, fanouts allow for one input to have more than one path through the circuit. If these paths have different propagation delays, then there's a possibility of a glitch where a change in input would cause the output to change twice or more potentially uh, in response to an input change. So here's an example where the input B fans out to two paths, one of which pass through, passes through three gates and one of, them, one of which passes through only two gates. Since this circuit maps to an SOP logic form. We can examine the corresponding Carnot map, and hopefully you remember Carnot maps from CSE 211. You can see that changing the B input while A equals 0 and C equals 1 will cause the circuit to jump from one grouping in the Carnot map to another, as opposed to just moving to different cells within the same grouping. So we're jumping from one grouping to another. Now, the output in both groupings is one, but because we're jumping from one group to another, this generally will cause a glitch. Although this method for detecting a glitch only applies to circuits that map to the SOP form. Looking more closely, you can see that when B changes from one to zero, the top input to the final OR gate changes from 0 to 1, and the bottom input changes from 1 to 0. But since there's a delay in the change in the top input, so the top input sees more delay from the inputs, there's a time, a period of time, when both inputs to the OR gate are 0, which causes the output to change from 1 to 0 and then back to 1. So this is leaving one Carnot map group which converts, goes from, converts the output from 1 to 0 and then entering another Carnot group which brings it back to 1. You can fix this glitch by adding an additional implicate that covers both values of B where A equals 0 and C equals 1. This way the OR gate will have an additional input that will remain 1 as we transition the value, the input value of B. Right? Now this is not usually necessary to do this though because glitches won't affect the correctness of synchronous circuits as long as they adhere to the dynamic discipline.
meaning that they meet the timing requirements required by the flip-flops. The notion of the dynamic discipline, which is sometimes, or, and actually in my experience, usually called timing closure, is a hugely important aspect of physical implementation of your designs into an ASIC or an FPGA, which uh, unfortunately we can't put into practice in this virtual course where we can't use actual FPGAs. But to understand this, this idea, we have to return to the topic of flip-flops. Now, we, we've previously talked about how flip-flops behave. Basically, a flip-flop will sample or take a snapshot of, I like to think of it as taking a snapshot of, its D input during the small amount of time the clock is transitioning from zero to one if it's a rising edge, a flip-flop, or one to zero if it's a falling edge or negative edge uh, active flip-flop. The clock transition point is the point in which the clock voltage is 50% of the supply voltage, so halfway between zero and one during a transition. After the transition point, the Q output of the flip-flop will update to reflect the value that of D at the transition point relative to the transition point in the clock. The Q output of a flip-flop will update after a period of time equal to at least the flip-flop's contamination delay or T sub CCQ or TCCQ, and at most, its propagation delay, or T sub PCQ, T PCQ. Um, so flip-flops also have a contamination delay and a propagation delay, but it is relative to the clock, the midpoint in the clock transition as compared to the midpoint of an input transition, of any input transition that causes an update in the output, as uh, as, it, as, as it's measured for a logic gate. So going back to this idea of the transition point of the clock, you might think of a sampling period or the time which the flip-flop is receptive to its input as being equal to the clock transition time uh, or the rise time or fall time, depending on if it's a rising or falling edge active flip-flop. So I always thought of it, you know, when I was first learning this, is the flip-flop is reading its input for the amount of time it takes the clock to go from zero or one, right? Um, so meaning that if we can just make the clock switch faster from zero to one, then the flip-flop will have a smaller sampling time. But it turns out that's not correct. That's totally wrong. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, actually. A flip-flop <clears throat> requires that its D input be stable for a period of time before its transition point, which is called the setup time, as well as a period of time after its transition point called the hold time. The sum of the setup time and the hold time is called the aperture time. So in other words, the reason what I said before was wrong is because the, the, the flip-flop actually, the, the sample time of the flip-flop has nothing to do with how fast the clock transitions, has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is a, the time before and the time after, which is fixed for each technology. There's a time before and a time after the transition point called the aperture, and that is the sample time okay so again when the clock hits the midpoint between zero and one that's the transition time and the the, the time that the, the, the flip-flop is paying attention to the d input is is a, a period before that transition time called the setup and the time after called the hold and together setup and hold is the aperture time now if the d input changes during the aperture time, the flip-flop might 
become metastable, which means that the Q output will become a voltage that is between zero and the supply voltage for an amount of time that's unpredictable. But it will eventually settle into its final state, which is whatever D was during the transition point. But this extra delay coming out of the flip-flop, essentially making the flip-flop's propagation delay change, will cause further problems in other circuit elements in your circuit. So obviously you want to avoid metastability. Stated another way, flip-flops only work predictably. In other words, their, their, their propagation and contamination delay is only valid if the D input is this, is, doesn't change during the aperture time. If the D input changes during the aperture time, in other words, within, within you know, the, the amount of time before and after the transition point, then the D flip-flop um, may become metastable and its delay will be unpredictable. In, in finite state machines and pipelines, the Q output of register R1 shown here is also labeled here as Q1, is feeding the inputs the combinational logic that is between the two registers. And the output of the combinational logic feeds into the D input of register R2, which is shown here as D2. And now this, th these two registers, by the way, or, or flip-flops, uh, will be the same in the case of a, a finite state machine, or they'll be different in the case of a, a pipeline. We must guarantee that the minimum and maximum delay between the registers, flip-flops, satisfies the setup and hold time. So let's begin with setup time. The input to D2 must arrive and stabilize before the setup time for the next clock cycle, which is the second rising edge of the clock shown here. The clock period is the time between transition points, which we uh, call T sub C or TC. TC is the budgeted time that we have for the propagation delay of R1 as well as the propagation delay of the combinational logic between the two registers as well as the setup time for the next clock cycle. So, and, and because we have to make sure that we leave the setup time as kind of a margin, we have, we have, to, get, we have to get the signal to R2 before the next clock edge, uh, the setup time before the next clock edge. Thus, the clock period must meet or exceed the propagation time of R1, which is TPCQ, plus the propagation delay of the logics, combination of logics critical path, or TPD, plus the setup time for the flip-flop register, uh, which we call T sub setup, or T setup. The T, PCQ, and T setup are technology parameters that we as designers have no control over. The only thing we can do is adjust the design of the combinational logic in a way that we can affect the propagation delay of the logic, which is the TPD. The, so T, PCQ, and T setup are considered the sequencing overhead, which is an unavoidable overhead. So this way, the T, PCQ, and the T setup are considered sequencing overhead, an unavoidable overhead to the delays needed by the logic that we build in between these two 
sequential elements of flip-flops. We can rewrite the inequality here to place the TPD alone on one side, which will serve as our design constraint when we perform our design or or maybe you know the synthesis from the HDL to the to the structural design. In other words, we must design our logic to limit its propagation time to be less than or equal to the target clock period minus the sequencing overhead. Now let's move on to hold time. In order to guarantee that D2 doesn't change for a time after the first clock edge, which is equal to the hold time, so this can get a little confusing. So previously when we were talking about setup time, we were, we were talking about getting the input to D2 before the second clock edge. Now we're talking about making sure that D2 doesn't change too quickly after the first clock edge because this would violate our hold time. So we must ensure that T holds is less than the contamination delay of R1 or uh, TCCQ plus the contamination delay of the short path in the combinational logic, which is the TCD. So as before, since uh, T hold and TCCQ are technology parameters that we have no control over, we can rewrite the equation to put the term that we can control TCD by itself on one side. Suppose we have the following design and we're given the technology parameters, which includes the flip-flop contamination and propagation delays, which is TCCQ and TPCQ. We're also given the T setup and T hold and the contamination and propagation delays of individual gates, which is TCD and TPD. Remember that our influence on time enclosure is only in how we arrange the gates in the combinational logic between the registers. Suppose we arrange the gates in the design as shown here. With this circuit and these technology parameters, we should be able to determine if this circuit meets the setup and, and hold time requirements. The main challenge is to find the critical path and the short path in the combinational logic. The critical path determines the propagation delay of the combinational logic as a whole, while the short path determines the contamination delay of the combinational logic as a whole. Finding these paths is slightly complicated by the fan out, which means there are more than one path, there's, there's, there's more than one path through the circuit than the number of inputs. Uh, so we have four inputs and actually five paths to the circuit. Sometimes the propagation and contamination delays might vary for different types of gates. And when I ask a question about this on a quiz or exam, I, I will probably give you different propagation and contamination delays for the different gates. So you have to consider, when you look at the paths to the circuit, you have to consider the composition of the path in terms of gates when you're calculating these. Uh, so in, in, in why, is, why would we do this? Well, in this case, this would, this would make it, if we had different uh, propagation and contamination delays for different gates, then you wouldn't be able to assume that the path containing the most gates is the critical path or the path with the least number of gates is the short path. Uh, you'd have to compute the delays for all paths manually. Um, but to make this example simple, um, we will uh, assume that, that all gates, regardless of the type, you know, and or not, th th we're going to assume that they all have the same propagation and contamination delay. So in this case, the critical path is the path containing the most gates, and the short path is the path containing the fewest gates. Looks like the critical path here has three gates, and the short path has one gate. So the propagation delay is 3 times TPD 
or 3 times 35 picoseconds, which is 105 picoseconds. The short path is 1 times TCD, or 1 times 25 picoseconds, or 25 picoseconds. Since we don't know the clock period, TC, in other words, it, in this case it's not given to us, we can compute the shortest possible clock period that would satisfy the setup time, which would need to be greater than or equal to TPCD, propagation delay of the flip-flop, which is 50 picoseconds, plus our logic propagation delay, which is 105 picoseconds, plus the T setup, which is 60 picoseconds, those three added together are 215 picoseconds. We can calculate the corresponding clock rate by taking the reciprocal of this, so 1 divided by 215 picoseconds is 4.65 gigahertz. Not bad. Now let's check the hold constraint. The hold constraint has nothing to do with the clock speed, or the clock period, TC. Nothing to do with that. The, we only need to, to add the TCCQ, which is 30 picoseconds, to the, the logics contamination delay, or TCD, which is 25 picoseconds, which gives us 55 picoseconds. And we compare this to T hold, which is 70 picoseconds. So that means that our circuit might change the input to the flip-flop after 55 picoseconds after the clock edge when in fact we're not supposed to change it for 70 picoseconds after the clock edge. This means we have a hold violation. Um, luckily, we can fix this by adding more delay, which is, you know, sort of counterintuitive. Usually you want your circuits to be faster, but in this case, in order to meet the hold constraint, we have to make it a little slower, at least uh, along the short path. So we can add buffers, which are uh, one input, one output gates that perform the identity function. In other words, they don't, they don't do anything um, other than add delay. Uh, and we can add that to, we can add those to any paths that violate the hold constraint. Now there might be multiple paths that violate the hold time, not just the shortest path. Now in this case, the paths that have two gates don't violate the hold constraint because two times TCD is 50 picoseconds, and when we add the the TCCQ. Uh, for the flip-flop contamination delay of the source flip-flop, which is 30 picoseconds, that gives us 80 total, which is greater than the T-hold of 70. But there are multiple paths in the circuit that contain the one gate, so there, basically there's, there's multiple short paths. So we have to add buffers to, uh, in this case there's two, so we have to add buffers to both. We're assuming that the TCD of the buffer is 25 picoseconds because the problem states that all gates have a TCD of 25 picoseconds. Uh, now, we have to be careful again that adding these buffers doesn't increase the critical path, which is very unlikely since we're adding them to the short path. Uh, but um, in this case, the, the longest path contains three gates, and we're bumping the short paths up from one to two gates, so we're okay. There's um, an additional complication though that we have to account for. The, te the technique we've been using up until this point for guaranteeing setup and hold time uh, is making an assumption that the clock edges occur at exactly the same time at all registers, flip-flops. But in reality, the clock edges occur at different times at different parts of the chip. <laughs> um, and this is, this is normal, um, this is called clock skew, which the clock skew determines the maximum amount of variance in when an edge occurs at different points on the chip. So we have a problem if the edge of clock one occurs, happens to occur because of clock skew. If it happens to occur later, then the edge of clock two 
meaning that the clock period, TC, in this case, is effectively smaller than its normal in nominal time. So to account for this, we have to subtract T skew from the TC, uh, or we can add the T skew to the other side of the, the inequality in which we're adding up propagation delays um, and, the, and the setup time. On the other hand, if the clock edge for R1 occurs earlier than the edge of clock two, this will give the signals propagating through the data path a head start. And they'll appear earlier to R2, making it more difficult to guarantee the hold time. So for this, we have to add the T skew to the hold time. So generally speaking, you're using the design tools. In other words, the compiler that converts your Verilog to gates. Uh, you're using that to guarantee setup and hold times. Of course, it still becomes a problem for you as a designer because uh, sometimes there's no way that the design tools can guarantee the setup and hold times considering what clock period you're giving them and how much logic you're trying to squeeze in within one clock cycle. But if it's possible, then the, the tools will take care of it and make the guarantees for you. In other words, you'll either make timing or you won't make timing. If you don't make timing, you have to break up your logic and your design, or you have to increase your clock period. However, uh, there are some cases where the delays through the, 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 the delays of a signal entering a, a register flip-flop are not determined by the design but by external circumstances that we can't account for during the design process. And specifically what I'm talking about is external inputs, I.O., inputs. Uh, for example, imagine we have a button that's connected to a, the input of a flip-flop. There's a chance that somebody might push or release the button during the aperture time of the flip-flop connected to the button. If this happens, the flip-flop will uh, most likely enter the metastable state in which it will drive its output to a voltage between 0 and 1 for an undetermined amount of time before eventually stabilizing at 0 or 1. So if we assume that the input to a flip-flop changes at a random time, we can evaluate the probability that the flip-flop will, will stabilize versus T where T is the amount of time after the change to the input. And we can do it with this function. So T res is the time needed to resolve to zero or one. And T zero and tau are properties of the circuit. Uh, T zero actually relates to the probability that the input will change within the aperture time. And tau is a parameter that determines how quickly the flip-flop will resolve after becoming metastable. If we plot this function for a 1 gigahertz or 1 nanosecond um, TC clock period um, with different parameters uh, for T0 and tau, you can see that, uh, for example, when T0 is 500 picoseconds and tau is 500 picoseconds, which is shown here as the black line, the probability that a flip-flop will still be unstable after one nanosecond, which is shown by the dashed line, uh, is about 10%. If we, now, if we instance another flip-flop in series with the original flip-flop, the chance of the second flip-flop becoming metastable is reduced, since if the even if the first flip-flop becomes metastable, as long as it resolves within T sub C, the clock period, minus the setup time, then the second flip-flop will see a stable signal, even though the first flip-flop had been metastable. In other words, uh, it gives the intermediate signal between the two flip-flops time to resolve uh, before the value is shifted from the first flip-flop to the second. This is called a synchronizer. The probability that a synchronizer will fail becomes a constant 
by selecting a point on the curve with uh, at TC minus T setup. For example, if we set T0 to 150 picoseconds and tau to 200 picoseconds uh, and TC to 2 nanoseconds, which is a 500 megahertz clock, uh, and if T setup is 100 picoseconds, then the probability of failure of a synchronizer is 5.6 times 10 to the negative sixth power. Pretty small. But if there are 10 edges per second entering the synchronizer, uh, which you know you'd get from someone pressing and releasing a button 10 times per second, then the mean time between failures would be 1 divided by 10 times the probability of failure, um, which we previously calculated, which would be 5 hours. So um, be sure that you're comfortable with calculating this uh, mean time to failure, which is essentially 1 divided by um, the number of events per second multiplied by the probability of failure of the synchronizer, which itself is just a variation on the probability to enter uh, metastability, except the T in that original equation is replaced by TC, which is the clock period, minus the setup time. So that's all we have for this lecture, and we'll see you next time.